The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, at home with the second daughter. People kind of got a kick out of it. And the real star of the household. This is Marlon Bundo. Charlotte Pence goes inside the surprisingly controversial book about her pet bunny. Plus, two brothers suffering from an incurable disease. I felt crushed, like, now what? How both were rescued from the brink of death. And all the chains were just broken off of me. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. North Korea's Kim Jong-un tells China's president that denuclearization is possible. The two leaders held a meeting in Beijing this week ahead of anticipated talks between Kim Jong-un and President Trump. However, many are wary of the North Korean regime and point to broken promises in the past. Heather Sells has our report. This meeting marks the first time that North Korea's Kim Jong-un has left his country since taking power six years ago. And the images are powerful. Leaders of two of the most feared countries in the world standing side by side solidifying their relationship. The summit was a surprise to most, although heightened security this week had raised speculation. And while it was an unofficial state visit, China literally rolled out the red carpet to welcome Kim Jong-un. So what does it mean? Experts point to timing. Relations between the two countries have frayed in recent months as China has supported tougher UN sanctions on North Korea. By visiting Beijing, Kim affirms a strong relationship and bolsters China's relevance, just before his upcoming meetings with South Korea and President Trump. The North Korean state media hasn't confirmed a U.S. meeting, but this week the Chinese state news agency said that North Korea is willing to hold a summit. The meeting also comes just days after President Trump appointed John Bolton as national security adviser. Bolton openly distrusts North Korea and calls a preemptive strike on it perfectly legitimate. Question, how do you know that the North Korean regime is lying? Answer, their lips are moving. North Korea conducted its most powerful nuclear test to date last year, plus three missiles that could hit the U.S. mainland. And new commercial imagery out this week shows it has resumed plutonium production, likely for its nuclear program. It's very much on the president's radar, who tweeted optimistically early today about chances for denuclearization on the Korean peninsula and affirmed that he looks forward to meeting with Kim. Trump plans to meet with Kim by May and denuclearization will likely be their most important conversation. Heather Sell, CBN News. And that may be one of the most important conversations for peace on the Korean Peninsula and safety and security for the U.S. mainland, for Hawaii, for Alaska, for California. Uh, if we can get nukes off the table, uh, that, that's a wonderful first step. But let's keep in mind the ultimate goal here needs to be the unification of Korea. Let there be one Korea, no, more, no longer a north and a south uh, with an arms race between them. Uh, wouldn't it be much better to unite them and in that uh, get rid of the spending on weapons and let's start spending on people. In other news, the Trump administration is stepping up the pressure on Russia. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. Thanks, Gordon. Through its NATO allies and in the United Nations, the United States is calling Russia to account. Tuesday, NATO Secretary General announced it's expelling seven staff from the Russian mission. So far, more than 20 nations say they're booting 130 Russian diplomats after the poisoning of a former Russian spy and his daughter in England. We're certainly applying pressure on Russia. We're certainly encouraging and working with our allies and partners also to do so. And I think uh, you've seen uh, an unprecedented number of countries step up and join the United States in that effort. At the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley called out Russia for weakening a proposed ceasefire in Syria, saying it helps the Assad regime carry out brutal assaults in key parts of the country. 
I would ask my Security Council colleagues to consider whether we are wrong when we point to Russian and Iranian forces working alongside Assad as being responsible for this slaughter. Haley says Russia is using its seat on the U.N. Security Council to shield the Assad regime. Well, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he'll testify before Congress. Facebook has been under fire since revelations a data firm with ties to President Trump's 2016 election campaign accessed information from 50 million users without their knowledge. Now Google and Twitter are also feeling the heat. The Senate Judiciary Chairman has invited their CEOs to testify at a data privacy hearing set for April 10th here in Washington. Well, faith is under attack here in America, perhaps no more so than online on sites like Twitter, Facebook and Google. Now, as Jenna Brado reports, faith leaders are taking a stand against the increasing censorship. I'm 100 percent pro-life. A campaign ad banned by Twitter. I fought Planned Parenthood and we stopped the sale of baby body parts. Thank God. Representative Marsha Blackburn talking abortion and her pro-life views that Twitter deemed inflammatory. I stand for hundreds of millions of honest Americans. But just one example of a conservative voice silenced by Silicon Valley. The big tech companies, uh, Google, uh, um, you know, which runs YouTube, you Facebook, they're really holding themselves out as the virtual public square. And come to find out, it's, it's really not a public square. It's not open to everybody. And we're seeing increasingly where they're beginning to uh, really censor who comes in. Tony Perkins, president of the Family Research Council, is standing with Blackburn and the national religious broadcasters to take on the tech giants like Twitter, Facebook, and Google. When you censor free speech for one, you censor it for all. Here they are at NRB's annual International Christian Media Convention. Uh, it is a problem. It's becoming a bigger problem. NRB President Jerry Johnson says this kind of censorship is everywhere. Facebook has, um, you know, taken posts from Todd Starnes of Fox News off, uh, Mike Huckabee, uh, Alan West, uh, Carol Swain, who's a PhD out of Vanderbilt. And so these are, you know, political or religious messages they don't like. They just remove the post. Incredible. NRB is also taking the fight to Capitol Hill, asking lawmakers to take action. I'm politically incorrect and proud of it. In Blackburn's case, Twitter eventually backed off its controversial decision and let her keep and pay to promote her ad. But that's not to say it won't happen again. The first step to securing our freedoms is to use our freedoms. Perkins has this practical word of advice. And so I think, you know, we look at the First Amendment. It's not something that we don't lock away in a box to protect it. It's something we want to exercise and use it and make it stronger. And so our message to Christians is live out your faith. Share your faith. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. Well, the March for Washington, for the March for Our Lives here in Washington last weekend rallied hundreds of thousands to protest gun violence. And students from that Parkland, Florida high school that suffered a massacre of 17 students and faculty took center stage at the event. CBN News spoke with the father of one of the victims. He told our Charlene Aaron he wants to focus on a bigger issue. Andrew Pollock is on a mission to keep students in America's schools safe, something he wasn't able to do for his own daughter. 18-year-old Meadow Pollock was one of 17 people killed when a gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. After being shot four times, Meadow still tried to protect another student. She covered the freshman, and this animal went down the hallway and shot my daughter another five times at point blank, and it went through her and killed the girl underneath her. During a televised listening session at the White House days after the shooting, Pollock spoke passionately about the need to protect schools. There should have been one school shooting and we should have fixed it. And I'm pissed because my daughter I'm not going to see again. Last weekend, students across America took to the streets, urging lawmakers to enact stricter gun laws. Pollock says while he's encouraged by this movement, he believes school security is more attainable at the moment. It's not a waste of time because they're, they're kids, they're making noise, they're bringing awareness to schools. So I applaud them for that. But I think if they focused on school safety first and then got all the schools safe in the country and then focused, focused on gun control, 
that would be something uh, that's achievable right now. Pollock also told me his son was not allowed to speak during the March for Our Lives rally because his speech didn't focus on gun control. They denied him to speak with a couple of other boys, too, that had different uh, agendas. They, they wanted to talk mostly about school safety. Pollock also pushed for newly passed gun laws in Florida, which include raising the age to purchase a firearm from 18 to 21, a ban on the sale or possession of bump stocks, and funding for armed school resource officers. Meanwhile, Pollock plans to build a playground honoring Meadow and the 16 others who lost their lives in the tragic school shooting. This weekend, he's holding an event called Ride for Meadow. Motorcycle enthusiasts are encouraged to sign up to help raise money for the project. I had this idea to build this playground in, in the community in Coral Springs. It's going to be built. And everyone, everyone in the community is going to be able to enjoy it and I'm going to build the memorial there for the other 16 victims. The playground, it can't be just a regular playground because it's for my daughter, so it has to be spectacular. I, w I wouldn't settle for anything less, and that's the way she's been her whole life. She was never average. My kid was never average. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. And you can find more information on the Ride for Meadow on our website, cbnnews.com. Gordon, back to you. Uh, let's pray that we don't ever have to build other memorials uh, to dead students. Uh, can we move together as a nation uh, to say, how do we stop this? How do we uh, have uh, some kind of control? Uh, I, I think, you know, the Virginia Tech shooting should have uh, enabled Congress to pass this kind of legislation. Maybe it needs to be done on a state-by-state -state basis, but... Uh, if there's any mental illness that uh, a qualified professional is spotting to say uh, this person is a potential danger, can't you go and instead of saying, well, we need to commit them to a mental institution, can you take an interim step to say this person shouldn't be allowed to buy firearms anymore? Uh, it turns out with the Virginia Tech shooting, there was warning signs. Uh, it turns out with the Colorado cinema uh, shooting, there were warning signs. And certainly on this one, in this school in Florida, there were plenty of warning signs uh, up and down the chain. So we need a procedure that when the warning signs are coming, well, let's make sure they can't get firearms so that they can go into schools, in, into theaters, and start killing people. Uh, and certainly killing people with assault weapons, uh, w it, it's insanity that we're, we're not taking steps to say, let's stop this. If we see a warning sign, well, from that point forward, you don't get to buy a firearm. Wendy? Common sense, right? Thanks, Gordon. Well, coming up, a new star is hopping on the scene at the White House. Meet the second bunny. This is Martin Wendo. People kind of got a kick out of it that we had a bunny at all and then we brought a bunny to DC. See how the Pence's pet rabbit is helping in the fight against human trafficking after this. There's a new power broker on the scene in Washington and his name is Marlon Bundo. He's the pet bunny who belongs to the vice president's family. Amber Strong sat down with the second lady, Karen Pence, and her daughter, Charlotte, to find out how their furry friend is helping to protect the lives of children. From the moment he hopped on the scene, this is Marlon Bundo. The second bunny, Marlon Bundo, has been a star on the rise. People kind of got a kick out of it that we had a bunny at all, and then we brought a bunny to D.C. With 20,000 Instagram followers and a growing fan base, Marlon Bundo did what any celebrity would do. He wrote a book. Sort of. The vice president's daughter, Charlotte, is the author behind Marlon Bundo's A Day in the Life of the Vice President. And second lady Karen Pence did the illustrations. We thought, you know, it'd be really fun to do a children's book um, that also educated kids on the role of the vice presidency. But this isn't just a book about a bunny hopping around following the Veep. 
A portion of the sales goes to causes near and dear to the Pence women, like Riley Children's Hospital and Tracy's Kids. Tracy's Kids, I've been on the board there for many years, and uh, I first got involved when I found out there was something called art therapy, which uh, affected children with cancer so much so that they would ask their parents, when do I get to go back to the hospital? Mrs. Pence says she's seen this particular type of healing all over the world. So from children to, to veterans. It's not arts and crafts. It's not like getting your paints out and feeling good after you paint. These are actually therapists who guide you through the art making process to actually bring some of the emotions and struggles and trauma that you're dealing with to the surface. The book also carries a deeper meaning for Charlotte. It supports A21, a nonprofit fighting against human trafficking. They have a lot of resources for people um, and resources for teachers to help teach people about the signs of human trafficking and how to notice it and recognize it so you can report it and then they have information on how you can report it um, and through those efforts they've rescued um, I mean tons of people who have been in these terrible situations and then they help them afterwards. Evangelist Christine Kane started A21 with the mission to abolish slavery everywhere. They're certainly spreading the word with operations in 12 different countries, including the U.S. This Marlon Bundle book isn't to be confused with others. Comedian John Oliver released a parody on the book at the same time as The Pences, as a criticism to the vice president's socially conservative stance. His book raises money for The Trevor Project, a charity dedicated to suicide prevention in LGBTQ youth. There are no hard feelings, though. Charlotte says she bought a copy of that book, too. Beyond raising money for charity, Mrs. Pence, an educator of 25 years, hopes the book teaches children about civics, too. Just like the vice president, Marlon Bundo's day begins here at the Naval Observatory. Then he heads over to Capitol Hill while the vice president presides over the Senate. The book is full of educational nuggets, and the Pence women say they planned it that way. At the back of the book, we listed several fun facts about the vice presidency or the Naval Observatory or other vice presidents. Marlin and the vice president end their day with scripture, an addition important to the second family. His faith is really central to his, his life, and we didn't think it would really be a fair thing to leave it out. It's just a part of who he is and who we are. Beyond teaching the children about the vice presidential duties, they hope this story helps educate people on the dangers of human trafficking and the power of healing through the arts. Amber Strong, CBN News at the Naval Observatory. Oh, congratulations to the Pence family. What a wonderful thing to do. What a wonderful thing to realize you're in a position of influence and let's use that position for good. Well, Charlotte and Karen Pence's book is called Marlon Bundo's A Day in the Life of the Vice President and it's available wherever books are sold. Wendy? All right, well, up next, two parents must face their worst fear. Doctors tell them that within a few years, both of their sons could die. I was beside myself. I didn't know if I was gonna lose my kids. Helplessness, there's nothing I could do. Watch how both boys are instantly healed of an incurable genetic disease after this. Corrine Sturtz knew something was definitely wrong with her first son, even though doctors couldn't find a diagnosis for his pain. Then when her second son began having identical symptoms, Corrine and her husband became desperate for an answer. Years later, when that answer came, it was devastating. Their boys had an incurable genetic disorder that could very well kill them both. Like most boys, Cameron, 15, and Caden, 8, like hanging out with friends and family and fighting epic video game battles. But unlike most boys, these brothers waged a battle from birth against an incurable disease that almost took their lives. I knew there was something that definitely was not right with Cameron. And he had an excruciating abdominal pain that wouldn't go away. As a mom of a young baby, that is constantly crying and in pain. My heart broke. 
Initial tests revealed nothing conclusive, so Corrine and Darren Sturtz were sent home with instructions to monitor Cameron's diet and blood sugar levels. I was um, constantly asking what is wrong, what is wrong, and they couldn't tell me. I think the biggest frustration for me was the fact that I couldn't do anything as a dad. Months and then years passed, and Cameron's intermittent symptoms worsened. The doctors had no explanation of why he would get up and vomit and he couldn't walk, he couldn't move. My continual prayers to God about my son was for answers. I was always asking for answers. In 2007, when Cameron was five and a half, the Sturtzes, who also had two daughters, welcomed home his baby brother, Caden. Pediatrician Dr. Niru Agarwal followed both boys from their births. He started having the same episodes, but worse than his brother. I had thought, oh no. I felt like crushed, like now what? Daily life for the couple swung wildly from moments of normalcy to grave sickness. Because doctors suspected hypoglycemia, the boys endured treatments of high doses of cornstarch and blood sugar monitoring 24 hours a day. Mom was excellent. She spent so many nights not sleeping at all with them. She was checking their blood sugar levels. So I would st we would still pray and, and believe my faith. Sometimes it would waver and then the Lord would remind me, yes. he has the answer. The Lord brought me to Luke chapter 18 about the persistent widow. So she didn't give up day or night. He just kept on telling me, persevere for an answer. As the years went by, Cameron and Caden only got worse. One harrowing episode left Caden near death. His blood sugar plummeted to 30 and he lost consciousness. He was rushed to the emergency room and slowly revived, but then he had to endure more painful blood draws. And I just laid my head on him and I said, you can scream and you can cry because I know it's gonna hurt but just don't move. After years with no definitive diagnosis, Corrine insisted that Caden and Cameron be seen by a pediatric geneticist. Genetics did an extensive workup. It came out with a very rare genetic disorder, glycogen storage disease. I was telling the family, you have to pick up the complications leading to the death of the kids. Complications like complete liver and organ failure. I was beside myself. I didn't know if I was gonna lose my kids. I didn't know what limitations they would have. Because the health of both boys was rapidly deteriorating, they were admitted to a research program at the University of Florida. After more exhaustive testing, Corrine and Darren were told that within a few years, Cameron and Caden, who was now no longer eating and had a feeding tube, would likely die from the disease helplessness. There's nothing I could do. All I knew is pray. I had the faith to believe that the Lord was going to do something, but I was afraid to ask for him to heal my boys. The fear is because what I believed was if I asked him to heal them, that he would take them from me. And I couldn't think of life without them. It was during their darkest hour that Darren says he had a breakthrough in prayer. The Lord gave me that scripture of Genesis 22 too, when the Lord asked Abraham to give Isaac as a sacrifice. Then I went back to my wife and I told her, I says, we gotta give the boys. We gotta give the boys to the Lord. He wants the boys. Not long after, in January 2014, 11 years after their ordeal began, the family attended a special revival service at their church. That's where Corrine received the same message from the Lord as Darren. The Lord just took me to a place of complete surrender. He said, I want everything, just give it to me. And I said, okay, Lord, if you take them, I will praise you. And if you heal them, I will praise you. And he said, now that I have control, Go get them because I'm gonna heal them. And we go up to the altar. And we get up to the altar. I just see my one oldest daughter. 
laying hands on my boys. And then I hear my son telling me, Dad, I felt the disease leave my body. I felt free. I felt like I could run again. I felt like I could do anything. And all the chains were just broken off of me. I felt the disease leave my body also. I could run all over the place and I could eat sugar. It felt like a small piece of heaven. One week later, medical tests confirmed what the family already knew. But oh, we had all their blood draws and all their blood was normal. Cameron never received another treatment. As a precaution, Caden was removed from treatment slowly. I mean, the kids are completely back to normal. It is a miracle that the kids are so sick and overnight or in few days, the kids are perfect. We laid our boys there at the altar. We gave them back to the Lord. And look what he did, is that our God is a healer. He is a miracle worker. I would be dead right now if he did not heal, because he healed me and my brother. Trust in God, believe in God, and don't give up. Trust in God, believe in God, and don't give up. He is the God of miracles. And boy, did that family see an incredible miracle. And there's those two boys, they felt the disease leave. Well, we have some great praise reports. Gordon, you've got one in your hand right now. Yes, Angela from New Providence, Pennsylvania. 10 years, she had pain in her right arm. She was watching this show last month, and Monday and I were hosting, and I said, there's someone you've had a condition that's a pinched nerve and it's really affected your right arm. Doctors do not have any hope for you because it has been a condition where they're saying the nerve is dead. God is able, and he's able to restore movement. He's able to get rid of any numbness or tingling and lack of strength. In Jesus' name, be healed and made whole. And then Wendy said, there's also someone, Gordon talked about a right arm, it's a right shoulder. Mm -hmm. It's very painful. And you have trouble even reaching up to grab things off the shelf. And you also just bummed out because you can't work out right now. But God's <laughs> going to heal that in Jesus' name. Well, Angela claimed both words. Immediately, the pain in the right arm and shoulder went away. And she has been pain-free since that day. And hallelujah. Amen. That's yay. It's, it's awful when you can't work out. I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> You're okay with that. Okay. <laughs> the couch just is fine today. <laughs> No pain is no pain. <laughs> right. Joe, <laughs> Joe from Dover, New Jersey, was diagnosed with fatty liver disease. His doctor immediately did an ultrasound and ran a series of blood tests. As was his routine, Joe called for prayer from his church and CBN. While waiting for his blood test results, he also had a strong compulsion to watch the 700 Club. Joe knew in his heart that God would be giving a word of knowledge through Gordon. While he was watching the show one day, he heard Gordon say, there's someone else, you have chronic liver disease and you don't consider yourself worthy because it's based on lifestyle, based on what you've done. So you live in condemnation and you think it's just for you to, ha to have chronic liver disease. God wants you to know he's healing you. He's forgiving you. Forgive yourself, receive, walk into the freedom God has for you and just let that liver be restored right now. All scarring, all cirrhosis, everything, be normal now. Every duct, every enzyme be restored. In Jesus' name, be healed and receive it now. Well, an hour later, when Joe received his test results, guess what? They showed no liver damage. The doctor told him to eat healthy and that he is in good shape. Yay. Praise the Lord. Yay. Let's go back to that wonderful testimony of the Sturts family. I call it the prayer surrender, where you're no longer naming it and claiming it. You're no longer making demands on God for healing. You're just surrendering to him and saying, I trust you. No matter how this turns out, no matter how bad it looks, I trust you. I know that you have my future. I know that you intend for me to be with you in eternity. I know that you love me and I trust you. So you're no longer demanding like some kind of you know, contractual basis. You're, you're doing that. You're saying, I trust you. I trust, I rely on you no matter the outcome. That's the point in time that Abraham reached when he offered Isaac. And the angel of the Lord congratulated him and said something very unusual. Now I know that you fear me. Hear those words, now I know. Even God didn't know 
that Abraham would reach that level of trust. Even God didn't know. Now I know that you fear me. And it's in those moments that you reach up and you touch into heaven where you say, I trust anything that you have for me. I trust you. And in those moments where you reach heaven, when you reach up and touch the hem of his garment, then you have every assurance that you will be restored. You will be made whole. You will be with him. So Wendy and I are going to agree. We're going to pray for you. Join with us and let's pray that wonderful prayer of salvation, surrender, where we say, God, I trust. I trust. No matter the outcome, I trust in your unfailing love. Let's pray. Lord, we just come together and we just pray especially for the chronically ill. Yes. In that story, we saw an amazing miracle, how you're even able to cure a genetic disease. Mm. You're able to remake our DNA. You're able to remake our cellular structure. You're able to make us whole. And Lord, we are amazed by what you can do. And so because of that, because of our awe of you, because we trust in your unfailing love, we just surrender into that. We surrender to you. And we declare that no matter what we're seeing, no matter what we're experiencing, we trust your unfailing love. And we ask right now that you would come and fill us with your love, with your acceptance, with your assurance that you're working all things together for our good. Lord, we don't have faith. It comes from you. So we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to you on the cross. We see your finished work. We look forward to your resurrection. And we look forward to our resurrection because you have promised it. Mm -hmm. So Lord, now, Stretch forth your hand to be with us and your promise that you will manifest yourself to us, that you will surround us with your presence, with your love, that you would be in us, that you would be Emmanuel, God with us. And so now, kingdom of God, come will of God be done, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Wendy, God just gave you something. Yeah, it's a, I just heard the Lord say, this is a more of an emotional healing. There's a father and son. Uh, it's been a very serious rift in your relationship. Um, you're both distraught. You don't see the way out, but God is going to restore uh, this precious relationship between this father and son. If that's you, receive it. Uh, and um, there is forgiveness and forgive each other. God is going to heal your relationship in Jesus name. There's someone with scarring in your esophagus and it's very difficult for you to swallow. And um, you've actually given up hope that you'll ever be normal again. God's able to restore. He's able to take away scar tissue. He's able to make all things new. So for you right now, do what you couldn't do before. If you couldn't swallow properly, if you couldn't drink properly, if you couldn't eat properly, go do that and realize God has healed you and restored you and made you make you whole again. Several people, you have chronic lung diseases and, and it's very difficult for you to breathe. Uh, some are on oxygen. God is healing your lungs right now. Just take that deep breath, that breath you're longing for, that breath of energy, that breath of life. Just take it into your lungs. Receive new lungs today, today for you, in Jesus' name. And I see um, there's a lady, you're holding uh, your hand on, the, on your lower right abdomen, and um, it's a mysterious pain. The doctors haven't been able to figure it out, but God is touching you right now. You, you are healed. Just receive it in Jesus' name. 
Lord God, we just lift up those with chronic illness. We lift up those with cancer. We lift up anyone with genetic diseases, anything the doctors have said is impossible. We just declare over them right now, with you all things are possible. You made the heavens, you stretched out the sky, you're able to remake us from our innermost being. So we rejoice in what you're doing, how you're, how you're working miracles today, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. If you've been healed, tell us. Let us know so we can share your good report. Just call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, one of the takeaways from that story is they prayed. Uh, they held on to God. They held on to the parable of the widow who demanded justice. And she kept knocking. She kept knocking. She kept knocking. We believe in prevailing prayer. And we're here for you. It's our honor to pray with you. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Wendy? Well, coming up later, meet a woman who was forced to flee the Nazis when she was just an infant. See how this Holocaust survivor is thriving today, living in Israel. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Well, as CBN News first reported, members of President Trump's cabinet meet weekly to study the Bible together and pray. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt is one of the 10 cabinet members who sponsor the Bible study. In a recent interview with CBN News, he described the fellowship as wonderful. Each of us are dealing with large issues. Yeah. And so to spend time with a friend, a colleague, a, fa a person who has a faith focus on how we do our job, uh, whether it's through prayer or through God's word, and to encourage one another in that regard is so, so important. Mm -hmm. and, and we have that in our, in our cabinet. Mm -hmm. And it's such, a, it's such a wonderful thing. The weekly Bible study is led by Ralph Drolinger, the founder and president of Capital Ministries. While some evangelical leaders are criticizing President Trump over a bill he recently signed, Congress passed a massive spending bill last week to avert a government shutdown. Now a group of evangelical friends to the White House say they're disappointed the president signed it. On Twitter, Johnny Moore released a statement saying, sliding in $500 million for Planned Parenthood, constitutes an immoral betrayal of the leadership of the Republican Party. They also called it a moment of weakness for the Trump administration. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Yelena is a Holocaust survivor who remembers having to hide from the German SS. Today, she says she has peace in her heart, and that's all thanks to people like you. Yelena is a widow who lives alone in her small apartment in Jerusalem. Her hardships began when she was born in a Ukrainian ghetto during the Holocaust. My mother gave birth to me soon after the Nazis took over our community. We were hunted by the SS from the start. Elena's mother took her from house to house looking for any non-Jewish person willing to help. They hid under the floorboards as the SS conducted searches. My mother tried to give me her milk but it was blood. It was a miracle. I didn't cry. If he had been discovered, we would have been shot right there. Yelena and her mother survived the Holocaust. Years later, she got married and moved to Israel. Her husband recently passed away and she can barely afford her apartment and not much else. So CBN Israel regularly takes her groceries and visits with her. I'm very happy when you come see me and bring me the wonderful food. It brightens my day. We also invite Yelena and other Holocaust survivors to social events we host in their honor. Christians play music for the survivors, listen to their stories, and share a meal with them. Yelena and the others get canes or walkers if they need them. Sometimes I don't feel strong in my legs. This cane helps keep me steady so I don't fall. I'm so grateful you gave it to me. Thanks to CBN Israel, Yelena is able to have a more active and fulfilling life. I say from all of us Holocaust survivors, thank you. You give love and support through this food and these events. 
God bless you and may you have the same peace in your heart that you have given me. It's wonderful what people can do when we get together to say, let's make a difference. If you want to do that, join with us. Join in the 700 Club. We're a lot more than just a TV show. We're reaching out around the world with hands of love and compassion. We're preaching the gospel in over 40 languages. Uh, tremendous audiences. 90% of our audience is now outside the United States. It's all made possible because people like you care enough to give. So if that's you, call us. 1-800-700-7000. Just say yes. I want to join the 700 Club. Now, when you call and join, I've got something for you. It's called Answered Prayer. Uh, it's a wonderful DVD teaching from my father. Uh, stories of how God answers prayers today, how he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then my father's insights from over 50 years, over half a century in ministry, uh, how God has led him to a life of prayer. Uh, it's yours when you join, so call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you want to give specifically to CBN Israel, to be a blessing to Israel, we have a designated fund for you. Uh, you can either go to CBN.com and on the giving page, there's a place there, or you can call us and say, I want to designate my gift to CBN Israel. Either way, do it now, 1-800-700-7000. Wendy? Those who bless Israel. God will bless. Shall be blessed. All right. Well, up next, we go behind the scenes of the new movie about the life of Richard Wormbrand, tortured for Christ. We don't shoot it in a way that exploits goriness. This is what the communists did and do to people. They treat them like animals, and they have lost their humanity in this cruelty. Director John Gruders talks more about his film on the founder of Voice of the Martyrs when we come back. Well, from the minute Richard Wormbrand stood up for Christ in a communist propaganda rally, he was a marked man. 14 years of imprisonment and torture followed. That's the subject of a new movie from director John Gruders. Take a look. The film Tortured for Christ tells the life story of Romanian pastor and Voice of the Martyrs founder Richard Wormbrand. The movie's release in March coincided with the 50th anniversary of Wormbrand's classic autobiography by the same title. Directed by John Groders, the movie is now available at torturedforchrist.com. In the post-war II era of communist atheism, the film depicts Pastor Wormbrand's arrest, 14 years of imprisonment and torture for his public faith in Christ. Were there specific artistic, technical, considerations you had to give for shooting the torture scenes. If you read Richard's books, Tortured for Christ or In God's Underground, he describes a lot more than it's in this film. Now, we didn't shoot it in a way that exploits goriness, but we also didn't just avoid it. Because this is what the communists did and do to people. They treat them like animals, and they have lost their humanity in this cruelty. Wormbram's film story begins prior to his arrest, as the communists convened the Congress of Cults, so named to demean Romania's religious leaders. And they brought all the ministers, rabbis, preachers of the, around the whole country together to sing the praises of communism, to, to roll out the propaganda, to really conscript their collaboration and cooperation with the party. And if you didn't do that, they would throw you in prison. So there's a scene in the film where Richard and Sabina are sitting there. They're listening to these communist speeches, one after the other. And Sabina whispers to Richard, They're spitting in the face of Christ. And he stands up. He comes down and says, We're here not to praise a political party, but to praise Christ. And it was being broadcast on the radio, so this, this was a terrible moment for the communists. They cut his microphone, they ended the broadcast, and he was a marked man, and he knew it. So John, overseeing the narrative of his life, looking at it now, yeah. what about Richard Wormbrand most impacts you? Richard grew up a atheistic Jew. He was off and running in a pretty successful career. He was going to be wealthy, but when he met Christ, I mean, all of that talent got reassigned to the kingdom. He just had this passionate desire to reach 
Well, two, two groups, Nazi Germans and Communist Russians. Richard thought about offense. Well, how do we reach these people for Christ? They know nothing about Jesus. He looked at these Russians and he saw emptiness. And he didn't feel empty and he wanted to give them life. And Richard, who you know ultimately survives or we wouldn't have these stories, he gets to the freedom of the American church. And at times, he said, I so miss the fellowship we once had in those days in the underground church. John, the tortured, persecuted church is happening all over the world. In our free world, are we ready for it? If we're going to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, don't just wait until you feel like it. I will never feel like it. So I got to ask God to give me a heart for these people who I know are my enemies right now. And through that, maybe some of them will no longer be enemies. Maybe we can win some of them through, through our love. Richard and Sabina modeled that. Interesting, John, isn't it? After founding Voice of Martyrs, Richard passes in 2001. He outlasted that atheism. <laughs> Is that fitting? All this will pass, but my word will never pass away. So what part of the word we have in us is eternal. And here we are, 70 years later, and he's speaking to us through his faithfulness. And you're right, no one's listening to Ceausescu anymore. We're listening to Wormbrand. That's awesome. <laughs> what do you hope audiences will take away? Not information. It's not even that we take away, oh, these poor people suffer. I hope audiences take away worship of God because we recognize the power of God then and now. We recognize how exciting it is to be a part of a kingdom that's advancing. Mm. Wow, what a story. Well, for more information on how to see the movie Tortured for Christ, just go to CBN.com for details. Well, it is time now for some honest answers, but more importantly, some questions. Okay, ask away. <laughs> okay, viewer, I led my five-year-old son in a salvation prayer when he recognized his sin after I read in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. As he grew up, however, he did not embrace the faith. Is he saved? So many children fall away from faith as they grow up and become prodigals. I pray daily for him, but I do admit, I wonder if he was actually saved when he was a little boy. As an adult, he has a soft heart in many ways, but sometimes scoffs at Christianity. When a child accepts Christ, is he or she sealed in Christ? Uh, boy, that's a tough question, and there are a lot of different answers to it. And uh, I'll, I'll get to the short answer. I don't know. Uh, and you look at verses in the New Testament, is it possible to lose salvation? Uh, is, uh, in my view, an open question. I know some churches hold as a doc matter of doctrine that you cannot. Um, but the Apostle Paul talked about some of his companions having a shipwreck of faith and going back to the world and leaving the cause of Christ. But for prodigals, for those who made a profession of Christ in their uh, childhood, who became children of God, uh, I hold to this. There's a reason the story of the prodigal son is in the Bible. And here's one of the keys to it. He never stops being a son. Even though he runs away, even though he spends his inheritance on riotous living, eventually he comes back home, and when he does, he's embraced, and he's a, he's a child of the house. He is still a child of God. We leave you these words from Mark, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it.